Good afternoon. Great pleasure to welcome you to the next in our series of Turing Lectures. We've had um, quite a few lectures from um, uh, experts in government, from academics, from all walks of life. I'm Andrew Blake, the Institute Director, and it's my great pleasure to introduce today Torre Grepel from DeepMind. Um, I've known Torre for um, a long time. He trained originally in Germany as a physicist, um, but rapidly saw the light and went to the Technical University of Berlin to do his PhD in neural networks with Obermeier and worked on um, large margin classifiers and rankers. He then did a postdoc at ETH and another postdoc um, uh, here in London with um, John Shaw Taylor, the renowned machine learning researcher, before joining um, the Microsoft lab, where I was also at the time, um, where he did some really very notable things. One of the, uh, one of the first things was uh, working with Ralph Herbrich and Tom Minka on uh, TrueSkill, where they used approximate Bayesian computation to solve a very tricky open problem at the time, which was how to do ranking of game players in multiplayer games. And you know, the, the problem is how you adjust the, the, the ranking of a player um, at each successive game so that in the future they'll get good challenges, they'll meet um, players of the right standard to make great games. So that was the True Skill System, 2006. Um, then he worked on some rather groundbreaking systems that were very influential in the company on how to match people doing searches with advertisers that um, want to present material. Uh, in 2013, he was involved in a, um, a very interesting and rather provocative study um, where he, uh, along with some researchers in Cambridge University, showed people just how much their, about their personality was revealed from their Facebook profiles and just quite ordinary things that you put on your Facebook profile, machine learning can show you, actually um, says quite a lot about you. Also in 2013, I found a quote from Torrey where he said that he had a passion for the game of Go and for the quest of developing a Go engine that plays as well as the best human players. And this was a remarkable prophecy because a few years later, um, working at DeepMind, he and his colleagues did exactly that in uh, the remarkable work that was published in Nature last year that um, doubtly, doubtless you've heard about um, the AlphaGo work. So um, a very interesting person, Torre, and therefore I'm completely confident that this afternoon's lecture on multi-agent learning is going to be fascinating and I look forward to it very much. Thanks, Torre. Well, thank you very much for the kind words, uh, Andrew, and for inviting me here. Um, I'm going to talk about um, a topic that I'm very passionate about, the role of multi-agent learning in artificial intelligence research. And if I'm successful today, uh, after the lecture, you would hopefully agree that it is crucial to look at multi-agent systems in order to make progress in artificial intelligence. The work I'm going to present is all in uh, collaboration with a fantastic team at DeepMind. So uh, maybe just to start um, about DeepMind, you may have heard of this company. Um, we have this um, beautiful two-word, very Im ambitious mission of solving intelligence. And um, we would uh, like to do that to make the world a better place. And it is really these two things that have attracted me and many other uh, people to work for DeepMind. And um, it is in this context that uh, I would like to talk about the role of multi-agent learning. So we have the notion of intelligence here, and um, it might be logical to ask, what is intelligence if we want to somehow solve it artificially, right? And uh, of course, this is 
a rather open question, and there's probably no one definition that will capture this very well. But a working definition that we're working with at DeepMind is that intelligence measures an agent's ability to achieve goals in a wide range of environments. And um, I hope it won't shock you when I put this, the most complex formula of the talk, uh, right here in front of you. Um, this is a, the attempt of a formal definition um, by Legg and Hutter of intelligence, and uh, I would like to briefly introduce you to this and uh, explain a few things about our methodology based on it. So, um, the idea here is to measure um, the intelligence of a policy pi, and we're defining it as the value that that policy pi achieves in an environment mu, and we average over all possible environments mu in some set of environments, or little worlds, if you like. And there's also a weighting factor, which basically says uh, that the weight is 2 to the minus the Kolmogorov complexity of that um, environment. And what that means is that we really want to put more weight on the simpler environments than on the more complex ones. There's a technical reason this thing really only converges if you have some kind of intelligent weighting there, but also it emphasizes the idea that um, we want a system that is general. And to start to be general, you want to start with the simplest tasks and have a system that can cover a lot of, or maybe most of the simple tasks, and can then move on to more complex tasks. And that's what's expressed here. But this uh, equation also gives us a nice um, methodology because it essentially says that we want to, um, we want generality in our intelligence. Intelligence isn't just solving one specific thing, but it is, uh, solving a broad set of tasks. And for example, you can think of this um, as an example, the set of 50 Atari games um, that uh, people from DeepMind were able um, to learn with deep reinforcement learning, and then this set would be those 50 games, and the idea would be to have a policy that can, can do well in all of these games. But eventually, of course, we would like this environment to encapsulate um, uh, many more things. So the most complex and interesting environments that we can find are multi-agent environments because they're not just static and follow a set of rules, but they're responding. And um, that's really what motivates um, our work in multi-agent systems. More specifically, um, I would like to emphasize three points here. One of the, the first one is that multi-agent thinking can really inspire interesting architectures because often it's a good idea to break down a problem into subcomponents, subagents, and that will yield a more flexible system than having a, a single monolithic system. Um, the second idea that motivates this is that uh, surely intelligence didn't arise in isolation. There wasn't just one intelligent being that suddenly became intelligent. There were uh, groups of agents, of animals, later of humans, that through their interaction came to be intelligent. And uh, finally, if we want to create artificially intelligent agents that are useful and beneficial in this world, then we, they will need to understand agency. They will understand, have to understand what we wish them to do, and they need to understand how to interact with all the other agents in this world, be that people, be that other AIs, or be that organizations, for example. So if we dive into this, the question of multi-agent designs, of course, has been explored before, for example, by Minsky in his Society of Minds. Uh, but you can also think of an um, organization as a multi-agent um, architecture. For example, um, the U.S. government is composed of many institutions that in turn comprise people that fill certain roles and so on. So it really is a multi-agent design. And uh, there are certain advantages to this kind of design. Typically, multi-agent designs are more robust than uh, single um, monolithic designs because if there's an agent failure, that can often be compensated. They're scalable in the sense that you can add more agents to an organization or to an architecture and, um, and have it grow in that way. You don't need to redesign the whole thing. And you might also be able to reuse or reconfigure the constituents in different ways. There's also challenges, of course. Uh, one of them is that you might, for your uh, system, have some kind of global goal, yet the agents might only have local actions and local visibility of the problem. And so that's one of the big challenges to overcome. 
There's also the problem of incentives and credit assignment. If you think about an organization, how do you incentivize people? And similarly, if you think about a multi-agent system, how can you give those agents the right reward function such that together they um, satisfy the goal or they, they reach the goal that you would like the system to um, satisfy? Um, finally, if we think about learning problems, then, of course, if you have multiple agents interacting, and each one of them is learning at the same time, that means that the environment seen by one agent is constantly drifting because the other agents are learning. And that's true for every one of those learning agents. So that also um, poses challenges. Now, the second point um, that I made is that we live in a multi-agent world, and there are just so many multi-agent aspects to it. If you think of these different systems that all involve multi-agency, if you think about these tasks here, agents need to compete, they cooperate, they coordinate with one another, they communicate, they have to predict each other's actions in order to be successful, and so on. And just to give you an example of how deeply embedded uh, these ideas are in our own minds, I would like uh, to show you this little video. Um, it's really just a bunch of geometric figures moving around on the screen. Um, but um, if you try to interpret what's happening, I think you will get the idea. Um, so the story goes on and on, um, but uh, I think uh, there's probably nobody in this room who did not project some kind of agency on these simple geometric figures. That's just how we interpret these, um, these things, because our minds are made to do that. This was a very early study, 1944, from uh, Heider and Simmel. Um, so finally, there's this idea that human intelligence, or intelligence in general, certainly didn't um, arise in isolation and there's, that there's a cumulative cultural effect at work here as well. So there's a competitive side to this. Um, say humans would have um, competed with other species, within our species, with other tribes. Individuals would have competed. And so all of these, this competitive pressure created ever-increasing task difficulties to which um, the, the, the mind needed to adapt. Similarly, uh, there's, of course, uh, the importance of cooperation, the other side of the pole, um, where um, the whole evolution of culture can be understood as also a, a cooperative phenomenon, where people were working together, where groups of, of humans were successful because they were able to more effectively work together, leading to the um, uh, begin of institutions, of states, and so on. And, um, and there's a very fascinating direction, I will not go into this more deeply, of cumulative culture. Because if you think about it, there's not just the uh, intelligence of the individual that we need to approximate, if you like, or to build. But if you put a human being into the woods alone, what can they really do? It is all the cultural context, all the inventions that have been made before, the uh, fact that we can share work and spe specialize in certain tasks. That, uh, that make us so, so powerful um, in this world. Okay, um, so uh, one thing about this cumulative culture that I wanted to mention, because I, I just find that so fascinating, is that um, really the things that uh, people discovered in the past, in this example, uh, certain mathematical fields uh, or ideas, um, that happened over a long period of time, as you see here, uh, thousands of years uh, from the past into the present. And if you then look here at what age these ideas are taught to children, then you see here this, um, this linear trend. So the older an idea is, um, the, the earlier we teach it to our children, because these ideas build upon one another. And this is just one, one view on this idea of uh, cumulative culture that uh, so powerfully uh, fuels um, our uh, living on this planet. Um, good, so um, for the remainder of the time, I would like to talk about two topics. Um, the first one is about one of the poles, learning to cooperate. 
And the other one is about the other pole, learning to compete. Um, and the first one here uh, is uh, work with Joe Libo, Vinicius Zambaldi, Mark Langto, and Janusz Marecki. And it deals with the notion of sequential social dilemmas. So uh, let's dive into that. Um, getting people to cooperate isn't always easy. And the way we can study this is through the notion of social dilemmas. So the idea is that um, social dilemmas are situations where any individual may profit from selfishness unless too many individuals choose the selfish option, in which case the whole group loses out. I think we've probably all been in this kind of uh, situation before. Um, and these situations expose the, uh, expose the tension between collective and individual rationality. Because as a group, we would want to do one thing, but as an individual, we might want to do something else. And there are a number of examples here, um, maybe best known the tragedy of the commons, uh, public goods sharing, free riders, you know, people going on the underground without paying, resource depletion, voter turnout, pollution, all of these are problems that uh, can be described in this type of framework and that maybe we can understand better in this type of framework and, and find solutions to in the systems that we design. And the main question that we ask in this field is, despite all these obstacles, essentially human selfishness, if you like, can cooperation emerge and be stable? So um, one way this has been studied in the past is the idea of a matrix game social dilemma. And the idea here is to really get to the drosophila of this problem, the simplest possible game that uh, exposes these ideas. And um, these games are typically two-player games. A, a given player can either cooperate or defect. And there's, there's a row player and a column player here. And this is the so-called payoff matrix, where this number R here tells us for the row player how much they get in terms of reward if they cooperate and if the other player also cooperates. So we call this here the reward. This is the penalty for mutual defection. And then we have the... Uh, um, the uh, sucker um, payoff, which is the, um, if you cooperate but the other agent defects, and the temptation, which is the payoff that tempts people to defect in the first place. And um, there's a certain set of um, in inequalities between these numbers that need to hold in order for this game to represent a, um, a social dilemma. And um, there are these two technical terms that will be important in the future. One of them is greed. It is if this temptation is greater than this reward, then players will be tempted out of greed to defect. And there's also this uh, technical notion of um, fear, which is if this punishment here is greater than the sucker payoff, then you would be tempted um, um, also to... Um, to defect, but this time out of fear and not out of greed. Okay, so that's basically the anatomy of the kind of problem we're looking at. Um, what are examples of such games? Here's a game called Chicken. I will not go into the details, but the, <laughs> the idea is basically um, two cars are driving um, towards each other, and either player could um, evade and go to the side. And um, if if neither of them does that, an, an accident would happen. But if they both, um, but if they, uh, uh, that's this cell here, but if they both swerve, then uh, everything is fine. But it's even a little better if you could go straight and the other guy um, avoids you. And um, so that then gives these undesirable Nash equilibria that this game tends to go towards. And um, here's another one, it's called Stag Hunt. The idea is that people could cooperate in order to find a great reward, but um, they might, there might be a smaller reward that they could go for that tempts them um, to go there. And they might do this out of fear that the other agent might do it and that they would be better off to do it as well if, in order to avoid, avoid this zero and to get that one. Um, so this one is an example of greed. This is an example of fear. And uh, the last one combines the two, and this is probably a game that many of you will know. It's the well-known prisoner's dilemma, um, um, where, which is driven by both greed and fear. So essentially, um, there are these two prisoners, and if they work together, um, they can, 
they get uh, to a positive outcome because uh, they don't um, act as witnesses against each other. If they both uh, act as witnesses, then they will go to prison both for a longer period of time. But there's this temptation um, to betray the other one in the hope that they will cooperate. And, uh, and that's expressed in these off-diagonal elements. And so this is particularly vicious as a, as a game theoretic scenario because there are these two forces, greed and fear, that act upon the agents. Um, okay, so much for that. But um, um, this system, as simple as it seems, the, this, these ideas have been used across many fields to look at um, how cooperation arises. And there have been different uh, studies, for example, about how norms might um, arise within such systems, what happens in social networks, uh, the idea of reciprocity, how can you, in a repeated game, make the other agent cooperate, and so on. And it's been an incredibly successful model. Um, however, there are uh, severe limitations to this model. And, of course, it is mostly this one-shot nature of the game. That's not really how, how life works, right? When agents make decisions, these are typically temporally extended. It's not just a single decision, it's a sequence of decisions. Um, cooperation and defection, which are just single labels in this game, really are entire policies that you need to play out in order to implement them. Um, Cooperativeness may also be a graded quantity. It's not clear that there's just cooperate or defect. There could be behaviors that are in between these two. Um, then um, if you model this as just a simultaneous decision between the two players, you're missing out on all of these nuanced behaviors where you can first see what the other seems to be starting to do and then adjust your own behavior and so on. So there's really a much richer dynamics in these systems involved. And um, finally, um, usually there's also a situation of partial information where the agents do not have full knowledge of what the other agent is doing. And so the idea of uh, the work I'm presenting here on sequential social dilemmas is to address uh, these shortcomings. And the idea is really to capture the essence of these uh, real-world social dilemmas but maintain this mixed motivation in which agents do not have a clear path towards collaboration or competition but somehow need to find their way uh, between in this tension. And um, the methodology that we use is for these SSDs, the sequential social dilemmas, is that we um, have, uh, we define games, sequential games, and we train agents using deep reinforcement learning to behave within these games and to learn to optimize some kind of reward. And the algorithms we're using, I will not talk about them in detail, are very similar to the ones that were, for example, used in the study on Atari games, um, the DQN algorithm. And uh, we will then be interested in using this as a model in the social science sense of how these learning uh, rational agents interact within these environments and we will draw conclusions about, about such um, agents. Okay, so here are um, two of the games that we're studying, studying here. The left one is called Gathering and the right one is called Wolfpack. And the idea of Gathering is that there are two agents and they're really just a, a blue and a red uh, pixel here. And these agents they um, get reward when they eat these green apples. Um, and they can also tag each other with this beam, uh, which might uh, take out the other agent, and the other agent then needs to pause collecting, and that gives some time for the, uh, for the tagger to get more apples. But there's no reward for tagging. You only ever get rewards uh, for eating these apples. Um, the second um, example that we're going to use, we call a wolf pack. And the idea is that um, these uh, red agents here, you can think of them as, as wolves, and they're trying to capture this target here, which is moving about. And um, the idea is that when they capture it together, they will get, get a higher reward, um, because then um, the, it, will, the, the, um, it will not be scavenged by other animals because they're together. Whereas if only a single wolf gets the target, then uh, the reward will be less. And um, these two um, setups or games, if you like, they differ in a crucial point that we'll explore a little later. 
because in this game, it's actually easier to cooperate because you can just ignore the other agent essentially and just collect apples. Um, whereas um, in this game, it's easier to defect. It's easier to go for the prey alone rather than to coordinate um, doing it together. And uh, we'll see the consequences of that, but clearly this is something that can only be expressed in this richer in, um, framework and would not be expressible in a simple uh, matrix game. Now, in order to make the connection to, um, to the previous literature, uh, we thought it was crucial to see if these games actually correspond to these traditional um, game theoretic views on, on social dilemmas. And so we took, for example, the gathering game here, and <clears throat> we did what is called a, an empirical game theoretic analysis of it. We picked two uh, policies, one of them cooperative and one of them defecting, and we let it play against two other cooperative and defecting um, policies to fill in a little square matrix with the expected rewards. And that tells us how well does a cooperative um, policy does do against another cooperative one, how well does it do against a defective one, and so on. And then we can analyze this little um, matrix in a game theoretic sense and figure out if it corresponds to any of the known um, game theoretic uh, social dilemmas. And what you see here is basically that for gathering, yes, it is the case that there are quite a few instances in which this game corresponds to a prisoner's dilemma. And for the wolf pack game, we find instances of the prisoner's dilemma as well as the stag hunt game and the chicken game. Um, in different um, configurations of this game. So we have a direct link between this richer world in which we can look at the sequential dynamics and the matrix theoretic world uh, where we can apply standard tools from game theory. Um, now I want to give you just a flavor of what kind of result you can get here. Because now, because we're in this richer learning environment, not just in a simple environment where we pick uh, one of two actions, we can study different factors that influence the emergence of cooperation. And so if we first look at the first row here, this is the gathering game, the one where you collect these apples, you can see that, for example, if you change the discount factor of the reinforcement learning algorithm, the one that determines how long-term your planning is, that uh, for longer-term planning, this actually leads to behavior where there's more tagging in the, uh, in the action. Uh, when you increase the batch size, you give them longer memory, it leads to a decrease in the amount of tagging that's happening. And similarly, in the wolf pack game, um, here we are looking at the lone wolf capture rate, so how much these wolves have a tendency to um, go capture alone rather than work together. We find the same dependencies. If we have the higher discount rate, then there will be more lone wolf captures, and if we have the lower one, there, there will be less and similarly for the batch size. So here, these games behave in qualitative, very similar ways with regard to these learning algorithms. But if you look at this last plot, you'll see a difference, because now here, we're varying the network size, essentially the computational capacity that we give to the neural network in order to learn the policies involved. And here you see blue is the larger network size and red is the uh, smaller network size. So the, the agents with the larger network size have the capacity to represent more richer um, policies. And you can see here that in, in this case, this uh, leads to, um, to a higher level of tagging uh, for the larger network case in this game of gathering. But in the other game, the higher network size actually leads to more teamwork and less lone wolf activity. So this is just an example of how you can now study what impact different aspects of the environment or of the learning algorithm have on the emergence of the cooperation in these types of games. So um, just to conclude um, this part, part of the talk, um, the, these sequential social dilemmas clearly have a lot more interesting dimensions that we can look at. And in particular, if we look at learning, because we're studying these learning algorithms that we put into these systems, um, the interesting thing is 
that these algorithms do not just learn how to make those decisions, they need to learn how to efficiently implement them. So one of these um, wolves cannot just say, I will now hunt together with my other wolf, but they have to figure out a way of actually doing it and learning it in the presence of the other wolf. That's the second thing. Um, effective cooperation policy is really much easier to learn if the other agent also cooperates. Right? If they don't even try to cooperate, then it would be harder to learn that. And that's a phenomenon you can only study in this uh, situation. Another point is that sometimes there are coordination sub-problems. So we might all be agreed that we want to work together, but now we need to figure out how to do it together. We need to coordinate our actions. And, um, and that uh, can be studied in this framework as well. There's also the idea that... <clears throat> There could be different implementations. Maybe there's different ways of working together in order to achieve a goal. And I'll give you an example here uh, from our wolf pack game, which is the idea that there's really two ways of, for these wolves to capture the target together. One of them is that they always stick together, and only when they're near the target will they then surround it. And the other one is that as they both go separately, and when one of the wolves finds it, it will wait for the other wolf to come and then they'll capture it together. So there's different ways of implementing cooperation, and this framework allows us to capture that. Um, okay, so we've learned how to cooperate, and uh, or we have learned something about how to cooperate. And uh, the second um, vignette here will be about the question of how we can learn to compete. Um, and again, of course, um, we're talking about a multi-agent problem, in this case two agents, a black player and a white player in the game of Go. And this is uh, joint work with David Silver, Aja Huang, and uh, the fantastic AlphaGo team at DeepMind. So, um, the game of Go. I actually wished I had an hour now and could all sit you all down um, with little Go boards and teach you how to play this game. Can I just have a show of hands who actually knows how to play Go? Ah, see, we would even have enough teachers to do this. Maybe we have to try this the next time. So now I just have to convince the rest of you what a fascinating game this is. So the game of Go is um, over 3,000 years old. There's uh, an estimated 40 million players in the world. And there's a staggering 10 to the 170 different goal positions. Now, uh, we often say that's more than the atoms in the known universe. But the truth is, and I know this audience can take the truth, <laughs> if there was a universe for every atom in the known universe, it would be similar to the number of atoms in that collection of universes. That's how complex it is. <laughs> okay, so why is uh, the game of Go so difficult? Why, what makes it so hard? It's actually not only difficult for computers, it's pretty hard for humans as well. Well, uh, the most obvious point is maybe the game tree complexity of the game, because in any given position, there's so many different moves you can make in the game of Go. The, it is played on this uh, 19 by 19 grid with black and white stones. And so the first stone that uh, black places on the board, which is empty, there's 361 different moves black could make. Okay, there's some symmetries, but roughly. And then white can make one of 360 remaining moves and so on. And that leads to this huge complexity. So the search space is huge. And it is difficult, therefore, to just enumerate all the possibilities and do a min-max search, which would be the standard procedure for smaller games. The second point is that it's also incredibly difficult to evaluate a given Go position and say if it is favorable for black or for white. This is particularly obvious for beginners when they see a position, I think. Um, but even for, for advanced Go players, it is a very difficult skill to do this. Um, just to give you an idea about the game space complexity again, this is an illustration of uh, the complexity of the game of chess. And there's maybe an average of 20 different moves at every stage that needs to be considered in the game of chess. And then if you compare that to the game of Go, where there's you know, 300 uh, different moves to be considered, that's just vast. And um, it's this vastness of the game tree that really motivates our approach to this problem. And um, the idea is that we want to use neural networks and train them to reduce the complexity of this search. And we do this in two ways. One network we call the value network, 
and it takes a Go position and it gives us an evaluation of how good that Go position is for, from Black's point of view or from White's point of view. Essentially something like a winning probability. And the architecture of this uh, neural network is that of a multi-layer convolutional neural network. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with the basic idea. These neural networks take into account translational invariance of the, of the, um, of the inputs by having these little windows that they effectively shift over the input and they have shared weights. And this is propagated up all the way to obtain the evaluation. So, in other words, it's really a simple mapping from an input, the image, if you like, or some representation of the board position to a number between zero and one that tells us how likely it is that black will win. Okay, the second um, ingredient is what we call the policy network. And the policy network um, is also a mapping that takes a position as input, but as output, it gives us a probability distribution over all the possible moves on the board. And so what this represents is, in some sense, the intuition of the Go player. When I, as a Go player, look at a board, I wouldn't consider all of the moves as being equally plausible. I would have some idea that some moves would look better than others. And that's what we're trying to capture in this policy network. And so we train it on pairs of positions and moves. And fortunately, um, Go players often record their games. And if you have a recorded game, then you have many pairs of positions and moves played, and you can learn this as a multi-class classification problem, effectively. Um, so how do we use these now? Go, coming back to this vast game tree that we were uh, talking about earlier, which has a fan out of roughly 300, so this is really just two here um, because of the limitations of the, uh, of the uh, illustration here. So we have this vast tree that we would have to expand in order to arrive at the truth of the best move. And now, given these two neural networks, we can reduce the depth of this search because while without those neural networks, we would have to play to the end to evaluate if black or white wins, now with the value network, we can um, evaluate much earlier if black has an advantage or white has an advantage, and hence we can save all the time that we would need to, to search this vast space uh, down here. Now, uh, at any move, we also don't want to look at all the possibilities, and that's where the, um, where the policy network comes in, because for a given move, we might already have a pretty good idea of what the good moves are, and we can effectively make the number of moves that we look at, the branching factor, much smaller using the uh, policy network. So, um, uh, a lot of work uh, in this project then has gone into training these neural networks, and I'd just like to show you how this works. And our starting point, which was absolutely crucial for this project, was a set of human expert game records. And there are um, online servers that, uh, where people play a lot of Go, and they log the games, and uh, we were able to tab into that resource. So we have a lot of game records, and the first thing that we did was we trained the supervised um, policy network simply as a classification problem. Position is the input, move played by the strong player is the output, we learn the mapping. Of course, it's crucial to have generalization to be able to have a new, never seen position and to be able to find a good move for that. When I first uh, joined DeepMind, uh, Dave Silver invited me to play against the very first version of these trained policy networks. And I thought, <laughs> how difficult can this be? It's just a neural network, right? But you can imagine, uh, surrounded by my new colleagues, the first few moves seemed easy, but slowly my position started going down the drain. And uh, I will never forget uh, the many um, friends I made that day, everyone knew me by then, right? He's the guy who lost in Go against the neural network. Yeah, um, okay. Um, now um, comes a crucial part here because um, we're looking at the multi-agent scenario and what's happening now is that we can take this now very fast policy network that we've already trained and we can let it play against itself. And um, because it's been well trained, we can we can now produce relatively high quality uh, games and we can do it fast. We can create a lot of them. 
And we can do reinforcement learning on these now because we can see for a given game if black or white wins and then we can reinforce the moves that led to the win and weaken the moves that led to the loss and in that way train the system by self-play. And the beauty here, of course, is in the multi-agent sense that we can really only do this because the system can play against itself. And as it improves, both sides improve, and so there's this beneficial improvement through the self-play uh, process. So we then um, generated a lot more self-play data, I think on the order of 30 million games, and um, then we were finally in a position to train the value network. Because now, if you have games, you can extract a position from a game, you can look at who won, black or white, and you can now train this system, again, simply as a classification problem or a, as a logistic regression problem, to predict what the winning probability in a given situation is. Um, good, let's uh, look at a, a few more details of how this training works. Um, so for the supervised learning of the policy network, we have this 12-layer convolutional uh, neural networks, um, we had roughly 30 million positions from, from human expert games. We filtered those to get um, uh, games from really strong players, of course. We didn't want to imitate weak players. And um, then we're really just maximizing the likelihood by stochastic gradient descent. So what this basically is, we have the probability of making a move in a given position, parameterized by sigma. And what we're trying to do here is we're trying to adjust the parameters of the neural network such that um, it becomes more likely that it would play the moves observed in the training sample. So the sec second thing here is the reinforcement learning of policy networks. That's the thing that I characterized as self-play. So here, again, we use the same architecture, but now the, the network is playing against itself, and um, we call the outcome of this game, uh, of a given game, Z. And so um, we're now weighting these updates by this outcome. So if black um, wins the game, then we will give uh, more weight to the black moves and we'll make the, the white moves that led to a loss, um, will make them less likely. Um, and so this led to a, to a very strong policy. I think this was the one that I lost against. I have to give myself some credit. It wasn't the purely supervised one. <clears throat> and um, finally, um, the reinforcement learning of value networks. Um, the idea here is that this um, is the value network. It represents the value of this position S and is parameterized by theta. And the nice thing is that we know the game outcome because we have the full game and we can use that game outcome as the target and we can adjust our parameters such that the value network is more likely to give the correct um, prediction of the game outcome. Um, you can see here that many of these things were quite compute intense um, and we were fortunate to have those uh, resources available to us. And um, this um, evaluation function that we trained here was really the first strong evaluation function that has ever been devised for the game of Go. So, uh, in the past, they had been hand-tuned, or people had uh, tried to train them in very simple ways, but this evaluation function really worked. It, um, it can predict uh, relatively accurately how, uh, who is favored in a given Go position. Okay, so now we have these two neural networks, and we need to understand how we can integrate them into the search. Of course, the policy network alone would already be able to just play because given a position, you can sample a move from it or take the move with the highest probability and it'll make a move. But that's uh, not, uh, we can do better than that by combining the policy network, the value network, and Monte Carlo tree search. And just to uh, explain quickly how that works, um, at every edge in this tree that we expand, um, we're collecting information about how, um, how well, um, this move did. And that's a combination of this Q and of our prior, which is provided by the policy network. So we have some a priori belief of how good a move is, but we will also use um, evidence from how well it turns out in the tree in order to see how good it is. And then we pick for, our, for expanding the tree um, the sum of these two terms to figure out which position to expand next. 
And that gives us a next position here. And the first thing that we do is we evaluate the policy network on it to find the next edges or the next possible moves that could be plausibly made or that experts would made in this particular, make in this particular position. We also evaluate the value network on it in order to figure out how good this position actually is. And we do a third thing, which is we play a random rollout to the end of the game and record if black or white wins that game. And this goes back to the Monte Carlo tree search methods that had up to this point been the strongest contender for producing the best Go programs and which had led to, um, to strong amateur Go play. Okay, so we've now expanded this tree, we've done these rollouts, we've evaluated our uh, networks on the resulting positions, and uh, the last thing we need to do is we need to back up all of this information in order to figure out which of the available moves in our root position is now the one that we want to play, the best one. And um, it's really a simple uh, averaging exercise in which we uh, propagate this information up the tree to figure out what the value of this position will be versus that position, say, to make that decision at the root of which move to play. And that's really all there is. Monte Carlo tree search combined with the value network to do early evaluations and the policy network to avoid expanding nonsensical moves but to focus the search on the plausible moves. Good. Um, another important element of such a project, of course, is evaluation. And uh, we put a lot of energy into good evaluation. And in order for you to understand what's going on, let me explain how you evaluate the playing strength of Go players. And that's you typically done on this traditional Q done scale. So at the bottom here, you have the beginners, the Qs. This is similar to, uh, to a system as in, in karate, for example. And as you become better, you will then advance to the one dan level, which is the first master level, and that goes up all the way to a nine dan. And then for professional players, there's an extra scale from one P to nine P, which are the professional dan levels, and that's roughly here. So that's the scale we're using, and we also use an ELO scale, um, because um, that uh, can be more easily uh, evaluated quantitatively. And now in some sense, from going from right to left here, you see the history of computer Go. Because at the beginning, there were programs like GNU Go, which um, tried to combine search with some handcrafted heuristics and other, um, other ideas, but never really took off and never reached a decent um, level here. Um, then there were uh, the first Monte Carlo tree search programs, for example, Fuego or Pachi, that um, uh, eventually did break through the one Dan level, which is this uh, strong amateur level, or uh, maybe not that strong, but um, okay amateur level. I'm a one Dan, that's why I'm a bit careful. <laughs> Uh, and then there was this new generation of, um, of uh, programs based on Monte Carlo tree search, Zen and Crazy Stone, that reached really strong amateur playing strength. And um, um, this is the level um, of, um, of AlphaGo as we published it in Nature, um, the beginning of um, or last year. And um, you can see that it is quite a bit above um, the computer programs that were available at that point and reaches into, into the professional uh, done levels here. And you have to imagine that this version, v V13, that beat the other computer opponents 494 out of 495 times. So this, is, this was seriously better than those previous programs. And um, then... Um, Later, when we were preparing for the match against Lee Sedol that you may have heard about, we had this V18 version, which would then beat the earlier version, V13, by giving it several handicap stones. These are moves that the black, the weaker player, can make on the board before the stronger player even engages. And um, uh, so the, this program was, uh, this version was considerably stronger than that one. Now, the problem, of course, is that these are just internal evaluations that we're doing, and really we needed uh, validation against um, humans as well. And um, so, whereas we had this uh, evaluation against these programs and by self-play, 
What we were missing is an evaluation against humans, and that's where um, our um, European Go champion, Fan Hui, comes into the story. Um, and we uh, evaluated AlphaGo against Fan Hui, who is a, a two-down professional player and the strongest player in Europe. And um, in this match, AlphaGo um, beat Fan Hui 5-0. Uh, um, Fan Hui was a fantastic uh, opponent. Um, he uh, later joined the AlphaGo team to help us improve it even further because uh, he was, had just developed such a deep understanding of, of the problem and of AlphaGo um, in the course of this match. But at this point, he definitely didn't want to lose, and uh, <laughs> it, was very, uh, it was very exciting. And then finally, um, in March 2016, we uh, felt ready to um, challenge maybe the strongest player um, in, uh, of the game of Go uh, currently, uh, Yi Sedol. He's a South Korean player and he has been dominating uh, tournaments over the past 10 years, has an incredible track record. Uh, you can think of him as the Roger Federer of Go, you know, that kind of consistency and, uh, and style. And so we had this uh, very exciting match in March 2016 um, where AlphaGo um, won four to one against Isidol, um, which was a beautiful result and cost us a lot of sweat, as you can imagine, because um, when that one game um, did go down, it, uh, it was very exciting for us. Of course, we, we also feel a great deal of respect for these players. And so we, in some sense, we were also happy that, that they were able to score this success. But on the other hand, you can imagine the, when you work so hard on a project that uh, it, it can, be, um, can be very exciting to see uh, this kind of thing unfold. Um, okay, and as a result, by the way, uh, AlphaGo then received the official Nine Dan Professional Certification from the uh, <laughs> Korean Go Association. Um, so um, I just want to, um, th there were many nice and interesting moves being made in this match. And some people even argue that some uh, sense of creativity, um, of innovation really emerged from, from AlphaGo's play. And certainly the, um, the professionals that we talked to are really excited to, to learn from AlphaGo and, and figure out new things about the game of Go. Um, here, um, in this position here in game two, um, AlphaGo um, played this particular move here, and it was really quite interesting to see. We had a professional um, uh, commentator, um, and he, he saw the move, he put the stone down and said, oh, no, this is probably wrong, this can't be true. And so he then looked again and said, well, no, that is actually what AlphaGo played, this move here, and he was a bit puzzled. And eventually, through analysis, he began to understand what a profound move this is. And it's a bit hard to uh, explain this here, but just to uh, maybe the idea, you see, in Go, you can uh, work on the third line, and if you have a row of stones, then this territory that you make counts towards your final score, and it's a very good thing to do. You, you get territory, and you're, making, you're using the edge of the board to get it. Now, you can also play on the fourth line. These stones are examples of that, one, two, three, four, and that gives you influence towards the center, and that's also considered to be a good thing. Maybe you can build a big territory in the center. Um, but playing such a shoulder move, as we call it, on the fifth line is very unusual because you should be afraid that white builds a wall like this and gets a lot of territory on the side. And so Go players would naturally reject that move and say that can't possibly be good, probably because their master told them that it can't be good, which their master told them and so on. So uh, here comes AlphaGo, plays this move, goes on and wins the game. And um, it was one of the many innovations that, uh, that I think uh, human players are now picking up from AlphaGo um, to improve their own games. Um, more recently, we had a little adventure because we wanted to launch some test games online to see how much progress we had made since then. And so um, Aja Huang uh, um, from the team, he played um, 60 games online against different professionals, mostly the top professionals in the world. Most of them have online accounts and they also play, play Go online on Go servers. And, um, 
these were, they were relatively short games with 20 seconds per move. Um, but the remarkable thing was that AlphaGo, under the name of Master and Magister, um, ended up winning all 60 of these games. And um, whereas at the beginning people were, didn't, weren't quite sure if this was AlphaGo or some other program and so on, when, when it came to 60 nil, there were thousands of people on the servers watching these games unfold and so on. And uh, it was beautiful to see, and um, also these 60 games are now a phenomenal resource for the Go community to study the way, the way uh, AlphaGo plays. And um, for example, the Grandmaster Gu Li said that together humans and AI will soon uncover the deeper mysteries of Go. So they've really taken on board AlphaGo as a possible tool where AI and humans can work together to, to understand something like uh, Go um, in a deeper way than ever before. Um, I just uh, want to uh, give credit to the AlphaGo team. Uh, this phenomenal bunch, and recently some more people uh, have all uh, done a fantastic job in working on this, uh, this project. And uh, I would also like to emphasize that in order to solve such a hard problem, it also is necessary to have a lot of very good people working on it. So this is not a small little project. This was a major effort, and it's been an incredible priv privilege to work with, with these uh, very smart people on the project. Um, so some lessons uh, from AlphaGo, maybe. So um, one might argue, okay, this can really only solve one problem, the game of Go, and it's a fairly specific problem, so maybe in contrast to what I said earlier. But um, really, we have a very generic planning architecture that combines the insights that neural networks can deliver with the systematic search uh, that uh, Monte Carlo Tree Search gives us. And um, this combination of learning from data and planning leads to these phenomenal results that some people within this narrow domain might even call creativity um, emerging. Um, the key really is that we took human data at the beginning and had the system learn from those human data and then used the self-play mechanism in order to, to bootstrap that and get the player even stronger beyond human performance eventually. And um, what we can see here is really also from the reactions of the professional players that now they view this AI as a tool and they're super excited to see what it comes up with in the domain that they've all invested so much lifetime into. And, um, and it was really good to see that. Um, I uh, sometimes, you know, in the press you see uh, remarks then, okay, this is approaching artificial general intelligence or something like that. Of course, that uh, is all um, nonsense, and I would like to delineate a little more precisely what has been achieved here by saying what hasn't been achieved. Of course, Go is, um, is a game where everything is fully observable, whereas the world isn't such. Uh, it's usually only very partially observable. Um, in Go, we know the model of the environment. We know exactly the rules of the game, whereas in the real world, we don't. Um, in the real world, there's typically more than just two agents, not just black and white. So that certainly uh, creates more complex situations. Um, the real world is definitely not a zero-sum game. We're not just all opposed to one another. We can work together to create a bigger pie. And so that's uh, definitely something that wasn't addressed in this work. Um, the dynamics in the real world is typically very complex, continuous, noisy, and all of that in contrast to the simple simplicity of the game. And uh, typically input spaces are much more high dimensional, just think about vision and our other sense organs, and action spaces are much richer than just picking a single move in a game. And finally, of course, there are all of these open questions in, in artificial intelligence um, that weren't addressed here. Um, Yet, it is an interesting case study because in this narrow domain, this particular approach um, has been so um, inspiring to those who know this domain. Okay, I would like to uh, wrap up by just uh, giving you the bigger picture of, of this kind of research direction. Um, a lot of work at DeepMind is on machine learning, and I think in general we can say that machine learning has been one of the big driving forces of what we now call AI research, but which uh, got a lot of its roots in machine learning. When you look at multi-agent system, there's an additional component, which is the game theoretic uh, aspect. 
because now you have potentially cooperative or adversarial scenarios and you need to take into account the agency of others. And game theory is, is one of those frameworks that, that are in a good position to address these problems. Finally, we can also learn from cognitive science and maybe from the social sciences because they've been um, busy studying um, multi-agent interactions for many years. And certainly on the work I presented on the emergence of cooperation, we've been um, uh, drawing heavily on insights from social science as well. Um, so if we look at multi-agent um, and how it can help us to, to achieve AI and make AI better, I think um, it can really help us create better AI systems. For example, if you think about personal digital assistants, they need to understand what you want. They need to perceive you as an agent and treat you as an agent. Um, this framework can help us study collective agent behavior. If you look at traffic, if you look at the economy, the environment, these are all challenges that can only be addressed by understanding the interaction of multiple agents. And finally, there are these very uh, important aspects of AI safety and AI ethics as the field moves forward and has greater and greater impact um, on our world. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, it is safe because it is a powerful technology and uh, we need to pay, put those safeguards in place and we need to think about the ethical aspects of AI as well. Okay, thank you very much.